Starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar. Today we have Foxhatch and XPOSoft presenting another Agile testing webinar. Um, the topic is team-based acceptance test-driven development and the title is Leading from Behind. Uh, my name is Jan Prinsen. I work at XPOSoft. I'm the old guy at the right in the photo. I'm born in Amsterdam and I'm the managing director of ExpoSoft. Um, we have a great speaker today, uh, Jim York. Hey Jim, welcome here. Uh, glad to be here, thanks for inviting me on. Okay. Hey Jim, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your experiences? Well, uh, I've been uh, an agile coach and, and trainer and a performer in the trenches for almost three decades now. Started off as a team of one, building applications from soup to nuts, and found myself quickly uh, out, uh, outstripped my capacity. So I started building teams and uh, eventually started building applications for clients outside of my organization. And not too long after that, I had clients contacting me, asking me to help them uh, with their teams, uh, helping them develop better products and uh, to make more effective teams. So for the last 15 years, that's been my focus. Is Great. helping leader, leaders build effective teams and products. And, and you have your own company? I do. I have a company with my wife, Melissa. Uh, it's called Fox Edge, and we're based in Virginia. Okay. How did you get derived the name? The name is, comes from a, a poem, a Greek poem, uh, about 2,500 years old. It says, the fox knows many things, the hedgehog knows one big thing. And when we formed our company, um, we recognized that there were organizations that uh, really were better in the world than anybody else. And, you know, they have this characteristic of the, of the fox, or sorry, of the hedgehog, of intense focus. And because they have this intense focus, they direct all of their energies towards that, that one thing that they're really good at, and they beat their competition. We also recognized at the same time that uh, sometimes there are fox companies um, you know, that are out there as well, and they're opportunistic, and they are very agile. They take advantage of, of the next thing that's coming. Yeah. The, the problem is that if you're just a fox or just a hedgehog, there's some downsides. If you're a hedgehog, sometimes your focus is so intense that you lose sight of relevance in the marketplace and, and competitors bash you by because they take advantage of things that you don't see. Um, foxes are, are just, uh, just as bad sometimes. That, uh, they chase the next bright, shiny object, so they're constantly <laughs> shifting here, there, never really getting you know, expert at any one particular thing. Uh, so what we found is that, that, that we work best with companies that have a balance, a, a balance of fox and, and hedgehog, this opportunistic kind of agile thing, as well as an intense focus on the product and service that they create for their customers. Great. They look pretty snuck together in your logo. Yeah, we created kind of a yin-yang. You know, you have, you'd have to meet Melissa and me to, to figure out which one of us is the fox. <laughs> okay, we'll leave that to guessing till after the webinar. <laughs> That's right. Okay, um, I work for ExpoSoft. We are a QA and testing companies. Uh, we're founded in 2006, and we help companies improve their quality processes and help them with test execution. We have offices in the U.S. and in Europe, Amsterdam, where I'm from and I am located. Um, before we get started, I'd like to notify you of our next Agile webinar. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting one. Uh, we got the two sisters, the Cheney sisters. One of them has a big career in government uh, procurement. The other one has a QA career. And they decided to combine their, their knowledge and expertise in a webinar on how to best work with outsourced Agile testing teams. Uh, this webinar is uh, next month, and I'll be sending you a link shortly via the chat box. Hope to see you there. Um, before I'll give the work to Jim, a uh, few words on housekeeping. Um, everyone except Jim and me is muted, uh, but we do encourage you to ask questions. Uh, please use the GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar panel on the right hand of your screen. Um, type them throughout the webinar, I'll respond. If it's appropriate, I'll try to fit them in during the webinar, and if not, we have a separate QA session, Q&A session at the end of the webinar. And tomorrow you'll get an email, and there in the email you'll find uh, information where you can find a recording of the webinar. 
Um, Jim. Well, Why don't you tell? Oh, yeah. sorry. Go, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just curious. I want to give the word to you to get started. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so before we start talking about agile. Um, where I want to start is uh, kind of looking at why a sequential approach that pushes testing off to the end is bad for quality and bad for people. Uh, when I started as a developer, analyst, tester, again, I was a team of one, you know, I didn't have any methodology that I was taught. So I just did what I thought made sense, which was just to get product out the door into customers' hands and you know have lots of conversations with them, make sure that I was building what they wanted. Lots of lots of conversation going back throughout the whole time that I was developing. And I worked in really tight development cycles. So you know I I would literally be giving the customer something almost every day um, so that they would have an incremental improvement to the, the product that they were using. Uh, it wasn't until I started building teams and we started having clients ask us to develop applications for them that I was exposed to to what uh, some people call the waterfall model or, or phase-based or sequential delivery model. And that was my first real introduction to you know, taking a, a large set of work and, where you do a lot of upfront planning and you have uh, specialists that are involved in various stages and stage gates. So you have analysts doing um, a lot of analysis, and then it gets hand off, handed off to designers who do design, and then it gets handed off to coders. And I, th I think we're all familiar with this model. We've, we've either experienced it personally or we've seen it. And um, you know, a lot of handoffs, a lot of walkthroughs in this process. And the, uh, the challenge here, I guess, is that, that quality is the last element in this cycle usually and it's and it's tacked on it's it's testing user acceptance testing all of this happens very very late in in this process and as a result um, we often run out of time and that's painful because that means that folks are working very late hours they're trying to get it done uh, we make shortcuts in order to meet the deadline uh, and people are, are frustrated and disappointed and often they're late surprises where you know, over the 12 to 24 months that something's been developed, you know, some change has happened. And as a result of that change, even if we did the analysis correctly based upon what we knew earlier, by the time we actually get to the implementation of this feature and we're showing it to customers, something moved. And, and despite having done the right thing, it turns out to be the wrong thing. Exactly. I remember this from uh, the first company I worked at, a development company. Uh, the client kept adding features in between, and the, the time delivery date was fixed, so we didn't have time to test it, and we were held responsible for the quality of the software. Yeah, yeah. Any delay or under, underestimation of the level of effort in the earlier stages impacts that time available for test. And, uh, you know, often what happens is that the sequential models are bounded by a triple constraint. You have the, the thing that's being asked for, the scope, and then we, we guess at a budget and a time. What's the cost and the time for this? And then it gets, it gets pulled into a, a working agreement or a contract. Um, so we're bound by these three dimensions. And what ends up happening is if we underestimated budget or time and we want to hold to the, the original scope, there's only one option. Quality is going to be reduced. It's the only option we have in, in solving this problem. And when we reduce quality, uh, these shortcuts, they, they come back and bite us. Uh, we get into to, uh, production, and we have issues there. And those issues begin to impact our future value creation for, for those uh, clients with the same product. I don't know, Jan, have you seen this in, in, your, in your clients? Yes. You mean the client the Expo Software clients before? Yeah, yeah, just clients in general. I mean, have you seen seen this triple constraint be a, a fairly common experience? Yeah, this is a very common experience that we see all over. Yeah, so so this is a, this is a challenge um, when whenever quality suffers, um, and this is true even with agile teams. If you make these quality shortcuts um, you know, later on, you know those issues start rising in in your production system, and we see a diminishing capacity to address new features because our, our time is being eroded by time that's spent to fix these quality issues. So if you look at the, you know, the value that, that is created by a, a team, 
you know, they're, they're delivering all of this quality and then it hits production and we thought it was good, but it wasn't so good. So the new time you now that we have available going forward, you know, we, we slowly are spending more and more time dealing with production issues. And if we don't, if we don't resolve these issues while we're continuing to build new features, each new feature adds a more, more quality net uh, because they're things that are leaking out into production. And over time, this, uh, this causes our, our teams to slowly degrade, uh, or our systems to degrade, to the point at which the amount of time that it takes to keep our systems alive um, consumes all of the team's capacity. So at that point, I think of, of a system in production as, as having become ossified. It, it's so brittle, everyone's afraid to touch it. If we do, in fact, touch it, we break something else. And hmm. it, it, we're really decaying at this point. Uh, the team has no more time for, for new things, and even the system itself um, that we built, uh, we can no longer keep at its original state. It's, it's, it's beginning to lose what it had when we started. So uh, we're, we're in the negative value creation at this point. Not only are we not out able to add new features, but the system that we're supporting it is slowly, slowly uh, disintegrating in, in our hands. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again, this is... This is a classic legacy system, and, and many of us find ourselves who have been in this uh, for a while uh, that you know we see systems that were out there, and now we are in the process of replacing them with something new. So, big, big challenge. And again, agile teams face this as well. It's it's very important to find a way to address these quality issues and ensure that you're delivering quality within your process. Do you find it easier to address these issue, issues working in an agile process? You know, I do find it easier um, in some respects. Um, and not that it is easy, um, but I do think that, that there's some agile techniques or practices that make solving this problem easier. Now, at the end of the day, the problem is still has to be solved by people. There's no magic fairy dust you can go out and buy that will uh, enable you to sprinkle some on the team and, and this problem is solved. The quality is easy is a tough issue to tackle, but there are Agile practices that help. Um, one of the most popular Agile frameworks that uh, is out there is called Scrum. Uh, and Scrum is probably a barely sufficient framework or skeleton that wraps itself around your existing process. And it, it brings some, some techniques that you can apply to solve this problem. So I'd like to, I'd like to talk a little bit about how we might approach solving this problem using Scrum. So before we, we get into what Scrum is, it would probably be a good idea to, to level set uh, what some of the terminology is that we have so we can, we can talk about this. So first, Scrum is a team-based framework. It doesn't make much sense if you're not working within a team. You, you need to have a group of people who are trying to work together, collaborate together uh, within this framework. And that team is, is not just any team. It's a team that is put together to solve a complex problem or produce a, a, a new product that has not been created before or to, to enhance a product in a direction that we, we just don't know because we've not been here before. We haven't done this particular enhancement before. Um, so it's creative work that this team is, is, is involved in. Scrum turns out to be a very effective framework for managing the work and the decisioning around that creation of that product or service. So in Scrum, we, we work in short time boxes. Um, we call these in Agile, generically, we call these iterations. But in Scrum, we use a specific term. It's called a sprint. It's a very intense uh, time box in which the team is collaborating to create a piece of functionality that works for a customer. Uh, they need to accomplish all that within the time box. What goes into the time box comes out of a, a queue of candidate work, and in Scrum we call this queue of work a product backlog, and that's an emerging list of prioritized work anytime we get new ideas that um, would help the team create a product or service that would, would better satisfy the needs of the customer. That new information is, is a embraced, um, it's, it's analyzed, it's assimilated into the, to the product backlog. If it's very valuable stuff, it, it finds its way toward the top, it's going to pop off in the, in 
the team's going to take that into one of their, their soon-to-come sprints. Uh, if it's an idea that's not so valuable, not so important, it always tends to stay kind of towards the bottom of the backlog. The person who's responsible in Scrum for ensuring that the product backlog is in the right order, meaning the highest value stuff's at the top, uh, that individual in Scrum, we call them a product owner. They represent the stakeholders. Um, they're financially responsible for the, the investment in the team's capacity to create a product. So they're, they're handling the budget and justifying the budget. They own the business case. And they are ultimately the one who is, is accepting features as the customer's uh, representative. Uh, so they're looking to build the best possible systems they can. And their, their chief tool is this product backlog the queue of work for the team. So if you look at the Scrum delivery cycle, it's, it's a very simple cycle. Um, it, it, on, the, uh, on the left, we have a product backlog. This is the prioritized queue of work. Again, the product owner is the one responsible for ensuring it's in the right sequence, highest value at the top. And the sprint cycle is uh, this time box. And at the beginning of the time box, we have a planning meeting where the team, the, the group of individuals who are building the product for the product owner, they make a decision collectively how much of that work they are willing to take on within a sprint cycle. And this is a, this is a little uh, interesting. I think this is one of the first practices that we're going to talk about this you know, today that is helpful in, in ensuring quality. And the team has the right in Scrum to determine how much work they take on. So the product owner does not have the right to tell the team, by the end of the sprint cycle, uh, you must accomplish this amount of work. The team tells the product owner, you know, based on what we understand that you want us to do, and at the level of quality to which you want us to do it, this is how much we can reasonably accomplish by the end of the sprint. So they're making a professional commitment to the product owner that they're going to do their best job to achieve that. And this works pretty well because the, the product owner gets to make all the decisions about sequence and priority, and the team gets to decide how much they'll take on. Um, so we're not getting these unreasonable pressures from a customer or stakeholder or the product owner to force the team to take on more than they can accomplish within a given amount of time. So we're eliminating the, the aspect of the triple constraint where you must hold to scope, time, and, and the the budget. We're saying we're going to have a team working in a time box. It's going to cost this amount of money to solve the team. So those are treated as if they're fixed. The scope is the variable. Now the team is controlling how much scope comes into a specific time box. This troubles um, managers and executives in companies sometimes because it's, it's different from what they're used to. And uh, at the end of the day, it's still a business decision by the product owner whether or not they're going to invest in this team. To, to advance the product. Um, so if the team is moving at a slower rate than is satisfying the business case, the product owner has financial responsibility over the success of the product. If their business case is not being validated, the, the business decision maker, the product owner, could make a decision that they would stop funding the team, they would stop the project, because the business case simply isn't being realized. Uh, so I think this is, this is kind of the first step. Let the team uh, pull work in to match their capacity to create quality work for the product owner. So, so we eliminate those pressures in Scrum. The, uh, the cycle that the team is working in, a sprint, uh, sprint cycle typically is a one to four week cycle. And this is the period of time that the team is building out the product. Um, they're engaging with the product owner in the, in the sprint to get clarification around the items that have come into the sprint. And every day, the team has a synchronization meeting called a daily Scrum. It's a short 15-minute meeting. Each team member is, is telling the other team members what they've been doing in the last 24 hours, how they've been helping the team you know, advance towards achieving their commitment in that sprint. Uh, so everybody gets to speak in that meeting that's on the team so that they understand where they are, and it helps them replan and adjust if they find that they're, they need to make an adjustment to meet their commitment. And the goal, of course, at the end of the sprint is to have stuff that works. Um, so that's, uh, that's our exit. Uh, at the end, we have a review meeting uh, of the features that we built. We invite stakeholders. They come in, take a look at the product, uh, give the product owner feedback, what they like, what they don't like, what they think might be good going forward. And the team 
uh, has a separate meeting after the review where they talk about their process. Uh, they have a retrospective and they discuss ways in which they might improve their improve their process so that it's more efficient and effective for the building of the product. So that is the Scrum delivery cycle. As I said, it's a very, very simple cycle. It's bare bones. Um, it does not include answers to how you actually build a product. That's left up to the organization and the team to figure out all the details of their, of their actual delivery process. This is simply a skeleton onto which other practices would be placed. Uh, so there's, uh, there are a couple things in here. The first one I mentioned was the sprint backlog, the team being able to throttle how much work comes into the team. Uh, another thing that helps with the quality is that at the end of the sprint, we have to show working features. So we are going to show something that works according to the quality standards that were established by the product owner prior to the team committing to taking that work on in the sprint. So there's an inspection there of whether or not we've hit that quality target and whether we've met the functional needs of the product owner in, in the feature that was built. So we get very rapid feedback if quality is not what it needs to be. And if the quality is not what it needs to be, the feature is, is either rejected or the feature is, is considered as a new product backlog item and there's clarification around what quality should be for that item and it gets fed into the team in, a, in some future sprint depending upon what its priority is. We always expect that priorities may shift, so it doesn't automatically go into the next sprint. It, it may be something that we're going to hold off and then we'll do sometime, sometime later. So that's the delivery cycle. Um, in order to make this work, we have to really understand what quality is. So one of the f basic assumptions in, in Agile is that we're going to have to find out what quality means um, from our customer. And in order to do that effectively, our customer needs to, to have interest in the work that we're doing. So we're making an assumption that the customer wants what we're working on and that they want it urgent and that they're going to be willing to spend the time with the team to help the team understand what quality is in, in, their, in their eyes. How, how do you do that, Tim? Do you sometimes well, formally define quality or do you have like working sessions in that? Or? I like to formally define quality and we do it really just enough just in time. So this, this product backlog is an emerging set of, of needs from the customer. So as, as a need becomes important and valuable, it starts to bubble up to the top of the product backlog. So if you look at the queue of the work, the product backlog queue, um, you could apply a simple Pareto analysis on it and realize very quickly that 80% of the value in that set of work is contained in the top 20% of the level of effort. So the things up there are worth a lot. And because they're worth a lot, we have customers that are willing to engage with us um, in the process of building the feature to help give us that information about what it is that they want and at what level of quality. So it's not as if we're trying to understand the quality characteristics of the entire queue. What we're doing is we're looking at a discrete item at the top of the queue, engaging in a conversation with the team and the customer, the business subject matter expert who knows what quality is or, or will be the best individual to identify when we miss the mark because occasionally customers don't understand what their minimum quality standard is when they first request the feature. Sometimes that's something that needs to be discovered because customers aren't going to be thinking about all the exception paths and the permutations that, that someone might take through you know, a workflow in a system. They're simply thinking about the way it's always supposed to work, the happy path as it were. Mm -hmm. So, and, and how do you tie this in? With, sorry, how do you tie this in with these higher level quality objectives with the product backlog? So, if we're talking about higher level product uh, or quality objectives from the aspect of the brand or kind of the, the, mm -hmm. the nature of the product that we're creating, that is something that is owned by the product owner in Scrum. So, the product owner would have conversations with uh, the business owners, the the key stakeholders in the the product itself to understand, you know, are we building a, a super high quality product or are we building something that is of lower quality? You know, what is the need? What do customers expect? There, I mean, there's certain things. I mean, if we're creating a pacemaker, um, there are different quality standards than if we're creating, um, you know, a, something that's, that's uh, less life critical. So 
we want to have conversations with the, with the, those that are responsible ultimately for the overall product to understand what is it that we're creating and what are those kind of larger quality standards that need to, need to be established for not only the product but perhaps for our brand. And then when we get into discrete items in the product backlog, those higher quality standards serve as a touchstone. So mm -hmm. as we're determining the discrete quality characteristics of this particular feature, we can kind of reach back and look at these larger quality standards and use those as a guideline. Even if we have a super high quality product or brand, it doesn't necessarily mean that all features within the product have those same quality standards. Mm -hmm. you know, there's, there are instances where let's say the happy path is generally where the 80% of the value comes. So if it, if it works, there, there's 80% of the value. Then there are exception cases. Some exception cases um, are more important than others. Uh, there's a probability, there's risk, there's business impact, there's all of these different characteristics that might impact the value of an exception case. So again, we would have a conversation with the customer and this is really where the, where the tester starts to, to, to add significant value in this process because customers aren't going to be recognizing those exception paths in their initial conversations. Those are things that as testers we think about those things all the time. We're thinking about all the things that might go wrong. Your customers are typically are not thinking about all the things that might go wrong. They're thinking about what they want to have it do when it does right. Mm -hmm. So the part of the equation with the, with the uh, tester on an Agile team is to begin to um, facilitate a conversation around these more discrete levels of quality. You know, what does it mean if this exception case is encountered? What is the business impact? Is that something that we should be creating and handling or is that something that we can safely ignore? Um, so again, it's a, it's a collaborative conversation. We're not simply making assumptions uh, about what it is that the customer wants. Can I take a couple so, of questions on the process now? We've got a few questions in. Yeah, let's take some questions. One is from John, and I think it kind of relates to what you just said. He says, he says it sounds like Scrum development needs to be a customer-driven requirement, or if there's a good probability of failure, I think he writes there. Yeah, it's customer-driven, or, or in some cases, if you're creating something that customers have never seen before, um, it, there, it may be that you have a really sharp um, and, and incredibly visionary person within your organization and they're creating the new product that nobody's seen before, it needs to be driven from their vision. And this discovery and exploration about what quality is, it, one of the advantages of Agile is, is since we don't have answers to those questions when we, when we begin, the very quick um, and often delivery that, that happens because of these rapid delivery cycles, it affords us the opportunity of getting that product in front of real customers so that we can get their reaction to this. So it is very much customer driven and uh, customer drives the input, dr customers drive the, the feedback and uh, you know drive the adaptations of what it is that we're going to do to, to discover where the value lies. You know, oftentimes we, we think we know where the value is, but until we actually show it to a customer, you know, they, they don't know whether or not that that hypothesis was correct. Okay, great. And we've got another question from Xia Wu, or do you want to continue first? Well, let's take the next question. Okay. Um, she says, or he says, our current project has new features during each sprint, but we struggle to fix a lot of defects in the end of each sprint. Poor quality with product release. How to assign the feature rate in each uh, sprint and to avoid a situation like this? Okay, so, so why don't we advance a little bit through our conversation because I think that will become, the answer to that will become a little bit more clear okay. as we go. It's, it's really, if I understand the nature of the question, it is, is how, how are we going to fit this, this testing aspect into the sprint and how, how, how does it work within these features that we're building? Um, so if we look at um, the, what, what happens when we put this Scrum framework in place, that fast, frequent delivery means that we have to fit everything into a cycle. So there are no separate cycles. There's no, there's no uh, cycle where we do a lot of analysis and design and then another cycle in which we take that analysis and design and, and then build and then another cycle where we do test. That, that's back to the sequential model. What Agile forces us to do is to do all of that activity within the sprint. 
So the same thing, uh, as, as the questioner uh, pointed out, the same thing is true in an agile cycle as is in a sequential model, is, is you still have the same problem that you're trying to solve. You're simply trying to solve it in a shorter time frame. You know, now all of a sudden there's a deadline that's looming, and it's not you know, nine months from now. It's, it's happening in the next two weeks. So we have to figure out how we're going to incorporate everything in that single cycle. So one way that you can help solve this is you don't take on big work within a cycle. You take on small work. So you want to take a feature and begin to slice it into smaller features. Um, so any feature that you have typically will have this happy path and it will have um, all of these different exception cases. You can make each one of those exception cases in addition to the happy path, you could make each one of those a separate item in the product backlog. So it's pretty likely that the team would initially take on the happy path and they would address that. And it could be a bare bones happy path. Remember, it's not dealing with any of the exception cases. So if the customer enters incorrect data, we're not addressing that yet in this feature at its current level of quality. Right now, the level of quality is simply addressing if the customer does everything right. Now, you may not be able to push that feature in that state out into production because it would be too much uh, impact on the business if a customer were to impact one of those exception cases that you weren't handling. But sometimes there are cases where that's good enough and customers say, hey, that's better than what I've got now. Go ahead and give that to me and I'll address the issues in production. Again, this is something that you would have to, to figure out through a conversation with the, the whole team and the customers uh, or customer representatives to find out what is an acceptable level of quality and what is okay to put into production. So we're going to chunk things down into smaller and smaller bits. The metaphor um, in Scrum, we, we call this sashimi. Instead of having to have the whole fish delivered to a customer, we, we deliver sashimi. We find fine slices of the product give it to the customer and they can use them right away. And they can also provide feedback on whether or not it's, it's a good fit, whether it's working for them. So if we're going into a, a sprint cycle, the way I like to think about it is make them small enough so that you, know, you have maybe 10 or so of these, these items in a given sprint cycle. So they're very, very small things. And that, that allows us a higher probability of being able to get them done by the end of the sprint. Another thing that these small features allow us to do is to swarm. Um, we will look at a feature as a team and drive all our efforts towards f doing that one feature and getting that one feature to a, a done sta state for the customer, meeting the level of quality, and then we move on to the next feature. We don't take all of the features and say, now we're going to do all the analysis on all these features. Now we're going to do all the design on all these features. Now, again, we're back into a waterfall, but we're just doing a mini waterfall within a sprint. What we're doing is we're saying, don't do it sequentially. Treat it more like a, a very valuable item that the whole team is going to swarm on and get that one item done, then move to the next item, then to move to the next item, then move to the next. So the team dynamic changes. We don't have handoffs. We don't have walkthroughs. We're all sitting together in the same place. We're working on the same thing. Um, if we chunk these features down small enough, there's a high probability that each and every single day we will be achieving a done status on at least one feature. So we, we, are, we are mitigating the risk that we run out of time at the end of the sprint. Jim, I was wondering, in, uh, with regards to the term swarming, a couple of weeks ago we had uh, Mike Nehu speaking on Agile and Agile testing, and he was stressing the, the interdisciplinary uh, ways of being in an agile team. How does interdisciplinary relate to swarming? Well, so swarming, each one of the team members comes with its own particular skill or knowledge or expertise, experience, um, and what we're looking at is, is each member contributing in this team. So their interaction with the team is very dynamic. It depends mm -hmm. upon the situation. So if we are trying to elicit the essential uh, you know, characteristics of a feature. What's the essence? You know, what is that happy path? What does it need to do? You know, this is an area where a tester should be a major contributor, uh, mm -hmm. understanding and having that conversation. Often in a sequential process, there's a, an, a 
group of business analysts that does this. And sometimes business analysts are also testers, and testers are business analysts. But sometimes these roles are separated. What we're saying is the work is of a very similar nature. So when we're engaged in an agile team, I would expect those with business analytical skills and those with testing skills to be asking kind of the, these, these clarifying questions to understand where the boundaries are for this feature in its current state in this current sprint. Once we've done that, testing is, is helping to focus the team's energies on what is important currently and ensuring that the team is not thinking too far forward and, and actually working on exception cases which are not part of the current quality standard. You know, ultimately before we get to production we probably will deal with a number of these exception cases, but for right now we may simply want to get feedback from a customer on do you like the feature you know, in, its, in the way that it's supposed to work. If the customer gives us feedback and says we don't like the feature in the way that it currently works, um, we're either going to take that information and create a new feature, or if the customer says, I don't want anything at all, at least we failed cheap. So we want, we want to make sure that if we're doing work and we're making discovery, that if we occasionally put something forward or do some work on something and, and it isn't what our customer needs, that, that we spend very little effort making that discovery. We want, we want to fail fast and then use the remaining time and capacity to figure out what is the right thing. So as we, as we look at this team, you know, the, the interaction, uh, it, it shifts from person to person to person depending upon the situation. So when it is something that requires uh, understanding the essence of the feature or clarifying boundaries or focusing the team's energy, um, that tends to be something that a, that a tester might, might contribute to it. Um, while the a tester would be asking a question, often we'll have um, somebody else on the team that, that adds to that question and seeks further clarification. Uh, and this is where we kind of eliminate the, the walkthroughs. We get this intense team, interdynamic um, exchange of information, very, very rapid, very high energy. Um, and it tends to, you know, it tends to gel the team more quickly by creating this focus on what it is that, that is most important for the team to get done in the current sprint. So very dynamic situational leadership. Um, I'm looking at every team member to have uh, the ability to step up and, and contribute when it is their skill set that helps the team see the way forward. So how does this work? Um, if, if we are looking at a test-driven development model, um, there's kind of a generic model that I, I use to explain this. I mean, you can use uh, test-driven development at many levels. Um, you can create management tests and go through a similar cycle. You can do unit testing. Um, and follow a single similar model. The, the, the level I want to talk about is kind of right in the middle. I mean, unit testing, we're down in the weeds, and, and management testing, we're way up in business strategy. I want to come it down, down to the middle layer, which is now we're talking about customers and what do customers want. So this is, this is feature-driven development that I'll, I'll explain. But the general model that, that you're seeing here, it, it is, is applicable in all of, all of the different levels. So let, let's walk around this model. Um, so first off, it's a team-based model. We're going to have the team together having a conversation. You know, I like to have them in a, in a room with a whiteboard and, and, and tools available to them that they can use to communicate more effectively. So lots of whiteboards, flip charts, markers, you know, just things that, that help the team you know, draw things out or, or to things that would help the conversation. So generally, the first part of the conversation would be, what is it that the customer wants to achieve as a result of having this feature built? So what is the business goal? What is the outcome that they expect to have happen as a result of having this new feature? You know, what, is it, what would they like the system to do that it doesn't do now? Um, and that outcome that they're looking for tends to drive, well, what is the need? What is the requirement? What is it that you'd like us to actually build? Um, so that establishes a goal, and we want to have some conversations around what, what is success criteria. So this is part of the conversation of listing the essence of the feature. Um, so once we understand what the results are and what the requirements and the success criteria, then we create a test um, or a series of tests that are going to be used to, to validate that we have, in fact, achieved the, the need um, that was defined in the earlier step. 
So this is test first. We are going to drive all of our design, all of our coding, all of our documentation, any work that's done by the team is going to be driven off of, is there a test that w this work helps us pass? Any work that's, that's done that is not driven by a test is potentially waste. So this is creating focus for the team to work on things to pass the test. I mean, in school, they would call this cheating. It's knowing what's on the test before we, before we take the test. In business, it just makes sense. Create a set of tests that clearly cover the things that the system needs to do and then ensure that the work is done to pass those tests. Once we've done the work, we test the feature to see whether or not it passes. If it doesn't pass, we're not done. We have to keep working until we can get it passing according to those, those tests. Once it is done, we have a feedback cycle that goes back into the desired results. And we assess whether or not there were any discoveries that were made along the way that might have impacted whether or not we think that that's the right thing to do. So let me give an example. Um, let's say we were doing a check writing application. We were getting everybody, everybody in the company get, is, is getting paid as a result of this new feature that we're creating, or check writing. Um, so the desired result is that we've got 10,000 employees and we want them all paid. And somebody raises the, the, their hand and says, hey, what about this? And we look over, and there's the tester. And the tester says, there are a lot of exception cases you have to be aware of. You know, occasionally, people work overtime. Uh, occasionally, people work fewer than the expected number of hours. Uh, what would you like us to do with these exception cases? And we talk about it, and we realize, wow, to do all of those exception cases, we couldn't possibly get all of those things done in a sprint, in a short time box. So let's chunk this down and let's do just the happy path on this round and we'll see what happens, see, see what happens with those checks which are too many hours, too few hours or whatever other things might pop up. So we write a test that says we want all 10,000 uh, workers to be paid. Um, we want to ensure that the, the uh, system does not crash. Um, if there are any exception cases, we want to capture those in a bucket of some sort so we can take a look at them to see how we might handle those. So we, we simply want the system to run against the 10,000, get the people paid who we want to have, who can be paid along a happy path, and put the ones that can't be paid off in a bucket, and we'll deal with those manually. So we, we have those tests. We do the work. We test it. We run all 10,000 employees through the, the, uh, the check paying algorithm. And we find out that, say, 9,970 people get paid. They were the ones that went by the happy path. 30 people didn't get paid. We look at the bucket that caught the exceptions. That was part of our acceptance criteria. We had to have a bucket. We had to be able to look at this thing and determine what's going on. We find out that 25 of them fall into five different kinds of exception cases. And we have manual workarounds. We can handle that. Uh, we look at the rest of them. No, there are five in here. Hmm, not sure. Those are, you know, oh wow, those are the execs in the company. We ran out of space on the, on the, the line for the zeros in the paycheck. Whoops, uh, what, what are we going to do? Do we not pay the executives? Do we write another, uh, another product backlog item that addresses this, this discovery? Um, that's part of the, the, the process is to elicit this new discovery. We're not going to hold the team accountable for not accommodating that particular type of paycheck because it was not part of the test. So it's, when we do this, it's, we're not thinking of these things as being bugs. They're, they're undesirable behaviors. They're, they're things that we probably need to correct before we go into production. But we're not going to blame the, the team and hold them accountable in a sprint cycle for, for work that could not possibly have been um, identified in advance or may have explicitly been excluded. So that's the typical cycle, and generally we want to do this um, by swarming. So we pick a feature up at the beginning of the sprint after we've done our sprint planning and made our commitment. We swarm on that. We go through this very quick cycle where we are discovering what the tests are and writing the, the, the uh, code and the design, the documentation. We are testing. We're determining whether or not we achieve the desired result. And if it's passing the test, that, that feature is done for this sprint. Any undesirable things that, that uh, are discovered in that process, they become candidate work and they go into the product backlog for consideration in a future sprint. So that is the general model and, and a suggested approach for doing it 
with your scrum team, swarm on the features and get them done as you go through the sprint. The role of testing in this process is to, to create focus, fit. I like to think of them as shepherds for the team. They're helping shepherd the team's activities and uh, helping the team stay focused and on target, not doing things that are not adding value to the, to the work that was committed to in the, in the current sprint. So to make this work, uh, it tends to be uh, helpful to work on only really important stuff, chunk the stuff into really small uh, chunks of value so that people can swarm on it. Don't starve the team for anything that they need to get the work done. You know, one of the things I often find with working with uh, new agile teams is that they don't have adequate uh, testing environments. You know, they've got a shared testing environment with other teams. Uh, you want to. We want to find your own testing environment where you are not constrained by waiting for your time slot, uh, because this is happening so fast, so quickly, and so often um, that you cannot anticipate scheduling for for a team for a testing environment. You want you want to get uh, something that is dedicated just to you. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Um, Everyone in the audience, if you have any questions, please ask them. Uh, Jim, we got a couple of questions on metrics. So what, let's let's have, have one of them. Um, well, just yeah, like Aparna, for instance, uh, he or she asked for test tracking metrics in agile testing. Okay, so Aparna, um, the, the, uh, it's a great question. Um, the testing in, in Agile you know, is often driven off of a different set of metrics than we might, might have um, in a traditional approach. One, one of the things that we find that kind of drives um, a lot of the collection of metrics are, are trying to solve specific problems. And, and Agile, in some cases, either eliminates the problem or it shifts the problem in such a way that we need to collect a different kind of metric. Um, so for example, um, often we have a development team that does work and when they're done, the, the resulting product gets pushed into a production environment and then we're in an operations and maintenance phase. And while we're in operations and maintenance, we're, we're capturing um, defects in production and those defects in productions don't necessarily get fed back to the original team that, that did the initial work on the product. So we end up getting two queues of work. We get a queue of work for new feature development or enhancements going forward on this product. Uh, occasionally we spin up a new project and we're capturing priorities there and we have a different um, bug tracking system that's capturing defects in production and the understanding what the priorities are between these two systems can be sometimes obscured. Um, so Agile solves that, Scrum specifically solves that by having a single queue of work for the team and it's one team. So anytime we discover a defect um, in production, that is not tracked in a separate bug tracking system. It is put into the product backlog and we're tracking it there. So a lot of the metrics that we have around um, bugs in production and tracking of those bugs in production through a separate bug tracking system, it, it, that, that is generally eliminated. We move that over into a single product backlog and now we're going to force the product owner um, to make trade-off decisions on whether we're going to fix something in production or whether we're going to work on this new feature. Um, in some cases, I mean, it's, it's in Agile, we call this eating your own dog food. Uh, if you are, if you are the uh, if you're the product owner that made the, the, the quality decision to put something into production that generates issues in the future, you are going to be the one that's going to have to decide how you're going to use your team's capacity in the future, whether you're going to address that issue that you created, or whether you're going to focus your energies on that that that, that neat new feature that you know one of your key stakeholders is asking for. So. It, it tends to drive the quality quality back home. So one of the things that, that uh, we're looking at from a quality metric perspective often is um, defects that occur in production that were not part of our tests. So we want to be highly disciplined. If we have a test and it isn't passed, we're not going to let that go into production. We're going to ensure that it uh, passes the quality standards. So we're not going to have these 
bugs in production. We're going to have defects that are in production that were explicitly decided that those were okay. Now, occasionally there will be things that, oh gosh, we didn't think of that, so it wasn't an explicit decision. So those would be the kinds of things that we'd find in production um, that would be captured and put back into the product backlog. Typically, teams will will want to capture a metric of what are these un what are these undesirable things that are happening in production that we did not make an explicit decision on that we just discovered that when it got into production. So we're keeping track of the number of, of production defects that, that are discovered in production as opposed to explicitly uh, excluded, you know, prior to reaching production. Uh, so it eliminates a lot of the finger pointing that we find uh, in a lot of organizations where bugs are treated as if they're a really bad thing and we shouldn't have those. Uh, in Agile we're saying if you have determined a test that identifies what it should do and it passes that test, we're not going to call these undesirable behaviors that we didn't test for um, bugs. We're going to call them. We're going to call them potential new features. And we're, going to, we're going to look. Uh, look well, the correction of it, a potential new feature. Uh, so we're not. We're not going to. You know, we're 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 trying to foster collaboration, not finger pointing. Uh, that, that's one of the one of the chief things that we're looking at, typically from a quality metric. I mean, there are other things that we look at as well. Um, you know, things that are more abstract, like customer satisfaction. Uh, but a lot of the things that we're tracking during the sprint, you know, the bug tracking, oh gosh, it got handed off to testing, and now testing is looking at it, we're finding all these things that the coders did wrong, or the designers didn't think about, or the analysts should have thought about. Instead, it's a team collaborative environment. If the tester points out, hey, what about this? The team looks at it and goes, okay, let's, you know, is that something that's on a test? Is that something that we should cover? If it is, then we're going to cover it. We're simply not done at the end of the sprint. We don't need to capture any metrics other than the fact that we didn't complete that feature. If we didn't complete that feature, we have unhappy stakeholders, we have unhappy product owner, and we have to deal with that new information in the next sprint. Uh, hopefully, we'll do a better job. So it becomes an incremental learning model, um, team-based and uh, less finger-pointing. Hmm, good point. Uh, I got a question from Joe. And I know this is a question that a lot of testing teams have. And his question is, how do you handle regression testing in this model? So regression testing is a tough issue. Um, it, it takes a very mature Agile team to be able to fit regression testing into any system that's been uh, in development for a while. Um, it's, it's quite easy in your first sprint, and you're working greenfield. You, you have an, a brand new application. Mm -hmm. So the only thing in the product backlog are new features. You don't have an existing system. So you build out you know, a handful of features in that first sprint. You create tests for them. Um, if you do those tests manually, um, you find out very quickly when you get into the second sprint, um, one of the qualifications of being done at the end of the sprint is that we not only have built these new features, but we haven't broken anything that was in existence you know, working before. So if we were doing manual testing, all of a sudden we find in the second sprint, not only must we test these new features, but we also must test the features that we built in the last sprint. And very quickly the team starts running out of capacity to create new features because the whole sprint duration is being spent doing manual testing. Um, so most times uh, teams in Agile will adopt a, an engineering practice of, of continuous integration, automated testing, including an automated regression test suite. And depending upon the complexity of your system, you may have full coverage or you may have a smoke test. Uh, it depends upon, in, in many ways, the, the size and complexity of the system that you're creating and your, your risk profile. Um, it, you may be working in a system where it's extremely risky um, not to do a full regression test all the time. Uh, you may have a release schedule into production where you have to release at the drop of a hat uh, and you release often. You, you cannot afford to have a, a, a week-long or a, or a two-week-long regression t test cycle. Um, you have to be able to drop into production immediately. So in those cases, uh, teams typically create um, highly automated uh, test suites that are running continuously to ensure that you know, our, our regression testing is being taken care of each and every single sprint. If you, if you think about it, if you, if you move several sprints um, and develop 
and do not uh, do your regression testing. There's a lot of regression testing that has to be done before you you are enabled to go to production. The same is true with uh, testing around security or performance. Yeah. Uh, Agile teams do testing in all of those areas, each and every single sprint. Uh, the big challenge is if you don't do it every sprint, you have to pay it off before you go to production. And we can calculate the time it takes to run a test. What we cannot do is calculate the time it will take to fix those things we found broken before we've run the tests. So that's a huge huh. risk that, yeah. that faces our product owner who is trying to get this into the hands of customers. It's this unknown set of work that is hanging out there until we've run the tests. We don't know what that work might be. So huge risk. So we want to do regression testing as we go. In the sprints, ideally. Within the sprint. Within the sprint, yes. Within the and, sprint. The, and the same goes for performance and security. Yes, performance, security testing, all of those things. We want to do them in, in, in the sprint. I mean, I even take test, the testing concepts as far as uh, if we need to have an audit, uh, if we have to have legal review. I think of those as being a test. Um, so if we need to ensure that we pass you know, legal muster for this new feature that we are creating, um, we can't release it into production without having a, a test, which is essentially putting it in front of our company's lawyer and having them review the, the feature that we are planning on releasing to production and getting their okay. Hmm. If we if we get their no uh, and they come back and say no you can't do this, um, we know we have more work to do before we can can get that feature in production. So that's all. It all adds up to risk. Any deferred risk is is or deferred testing is risk, and we're trying to reduce risk and pay as we go. If you don't pay as you go, you can't be agile. Agile agile. You want to be able to pivot at any point and set off in a new direction. Any time that you've left undone work, you have to you have to complete that work. Or abandon it. Abandoning it is just—it's pure waste. If it never gets into the hands of customers, we we can't we can't uh, realize the value from all of the hard work that the team has done to create that feature in the first place. So we want to we want to eliminate or reduce significantly the risk of doing work that doesn't result in, in value to customers. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jim, we're hitting the the hour, uh, so I want to thank you very much. Uh, or do you want to ha handle one short question? Um, Just kill one in. Good. Yeah, okay. Uh, Jason, as we have different test levels, we usually have limited time or effort to update all test cases for all test levels. I mean rapid changes would affect the previous test cases. Right, right. So this is one of the things that, that swarming on an individual feature can help with because you are having very rapid discovery on something very small you can take corrective action and apply that learning very quickly within the sprint on that feature. Here's where it gets a little slippery. If it is a minor nuance to the story that you need to capture through a minor test that requires minor work, you can do that within the current sprint on the current story within the team's current commitment. If that discovery results in the, in the feature blowing up into something new that nobody anticipated, that should go back into the product backlog. There should be a conversation with the product owner, helping them understand what this new discovery means, uh, what, what a new feature would look like in the product backlog that would incorporate this discovery, and the product owner can take that information back and queue it up for a future sprint. Okay. So identify your tests up front. It'll help keep you out of this problem. You know, any new discoveries that, that tell you that you need to have new tests, those are new product backlog candidates. Thank you very much. The church bells are ringing here. Uh, <laughs> there's some questions we didn't cover. I'll try to get back to you guys uh, via email or if Jim responds via email afterwards. Uh, I want to thank the audience for, for joining and Jim, I want to thank you very much. It was very interesting and we all learned a lot. Yes, and again, Jan, thanks for having me today. Okay, have a great day everyone and hope to see you at some of our next webinars. Bye-bye. <laughs>